As part of my scaling series, I'm inviting good friends on to talk about how they've scaled their businesses up or down. And today I invited a good friend of mine, Glenn Roush from Texas, and Glenn and I are gonna talk about how he has scaled his business up. Welcome to another episode of the Wedding Business Solutions Podcast. I'm your host, Alan Berg, speaker, author, sales trainer, website reviewer, here to help you and your wedding and event business sell more, profit more, and have more fun doing it. Enjoy this episode. Welcome to the Wedding Business Solutions Podcast. Glenn Roush, how are you doing today? Man, I'm doing great, Alan. Thanks for having me today. Well, thank you for joining me here. And as I kind of explained to you offline, I'm doing this series for my podcast on scaling because there's a lot of people in the wedding and event industry that are either thinking about scaling their business up and some people actually about thinking about scaling their business down, which yep. you might you might do at some point, right? You might get to that crest at some point. And I wanted to invite you on because you have scaled your business up and you're so well respected in your area. And I wanted to give some tips for people and the things you learned along the way, they like, if I only knew then, oh, man. <laughs> I might or might not do it. So, so give us a little quick background, name of your company, when you started and where you got, where you are now. Okay. So my company is, uh, La the LaForce event group. We have LaForce productions, LaForce entertainment, LaForce uh, media and streaming. We have a few different, um, subs under the big umbrella, but LaForce event group really kind of encapsulates everything. Um, LaForce is my wife's maiden name. That's where it comes from. <laughs> I started, uh, I started doing weddings in 2006. I was a DJ in college uh, just to make money to pay bills. And then my friends started getting married and that is how I ended up in the wedding industry. Uh, found out I loved it. Um, and so started, uh, I, so my background is in finance and accounting. I've got a master's in taxation. I was doing tax work and uh, hated my life doing that. I just was not created to sit in a cubicle. Uh, at the time, I didn't know it was ADHD. So, uh, so many things make sense now, but I, I was miserable sitting in a cube because I just knew that I was not made to sit there in a little box for 12 hours a day um, doing tax returns. My DJ business started taking off and uh, I was, I'm blessed to have a wonderful wife and she spent about the better process of a year telling me that I should quit my job. And uh, finally, like a smart man, I listened to her and uh, I quit and started LaForce Entertainment. Um, and one of the reasons I, so originally I was Glen Roush Entertainment. This is just a little nugget. Um, I pivoted to, Glen, to LaForce Entertainment because um, I had an experience at one of my weddings where I was working with a high-end wedding photographer. It was actually as I was starting to book some of my first high-end weddings in Dallas. Uh, I saw that on my planning forms that this was the photographer. Uh, I called her to just introduce myself, tell her I was excited to work with her, go over some of the details that I had. And her assistant uh, called me back and informed me that she would not actually be the one shooting the wedding. It would be one of her associates that would be shooting the wedding, who did a fantastic job and I've, I've ended up being friends with. But I just, in that moment, I remembered that tiny little bit of disappointment on, oh, I don't get, I'm going to change the name. I don't get Jennifer. Uh, I get Jennifer second. And so yeah. when I knew that I was going to branch out and scale up, I knew that I didn't want my team to go out and have to deal with that. Cause I was originally Glenn Roush entertainment and I just didn't want everybody to show up and constantly the catering manager or whoever, Oh, you're Glenn. No, I'm, I'm Creighton. I work for Glenn. <laughs> you Glenn? No, I'm Nate. I work for Glenn. And I just didn't want that to be how the conversation went. And it was a wonderful decision because what I wasn't smart enough to know at the time that I've learned now is it is a fantastic benefit because uh, I'm not the marquee. And so anyone that wants to join our team gets to join that with the freedom to be as great and as fantastic and as huge of an entertainer as they want to be and not necessarily have to be feeling like they're flying under my flag, but under our flag. And so how many different entertainers do you have now? Uh, 29 entertainers, I was about to say 30, but one, one has decided that he's wanting to hang up his, his turntables for a while. So just right at 30 DJs. Okay. Uh, so you, Glenn Roush entertainment started when? Uh, 2006. And so 2000. then in 2010, LaForce entertainment started. Um, okay. and that was just a simple going around and recruiting DJs. I don't know how many DJs I've met with and talked to from around Dallas and, uh, you know, and everybody at the time thought I was crazy because 
uh, and uh, some people still do. And it's fine. And it's, it was wacky. I was a, I was a young man with a big dream and I'm out here talking craziness of, you know, uh, imagine if there was a multi-op that was targeted towards the high end client that wanted to find a really fantastic DJ. And, uh, and, I, and they're just looking at me like, cause all the multi-ops they had experience with were multi-ops that, uh, uh, multi-ops for anybody listening that you're not familiar is multi-operational, multi-systems, multi-DJs. Um, and all of their experience were with companies that just, if they were a multi-op, they hired anybody off the street, they'd give them maybe 15 minutes to an hour of training and then put them on the event. And there was a lot of on the job training that they had to deal with and work their way through. So everyone was just telling me, oh, high end multi-op never will work. Right. So it's people's perception of what that means and you change it. So I, I love your story because your story is so common. There were photographers listening that started the same way, right? I was taking pictures in college and my friends started getting married, right? It, but my, my son's girlfriend, she's a photographer in Pennsylvania. She's got 21 first cousins, I think it is. So wow. that's how she got pulled in is, you know, hey, Amelia, when you're coming to the wedding, could you bring your camera, you know, cause that type of thing. The, the idea of going to the different name is really important. I, I said to you offline, when I started my business 10 years ago, when I left the knot, I made allenberg.com as the website, but that was a conscious decision. Cause I was, yeah. I thought at the time, should I have a name? And my company does have a name. If you're watching the video right over my shoulder, you see Wedding Business Solutions. It's also the name of the podcast, Wedding Business Solutions, LLC. That is my business name. But I chose to go out as allenberg.com because my brand was Allen Berg. My brand at The Knot was Allen Berg. That's how you knew me, you know, originally was from The Knot. Yeah. And I've made the decision not to do what you did because I didn't plan on handing, ha having any other speakers, any other trainers. So anybody who's listening, if you're thinking about growing your business, what Glenn's point there of, are you going to disappoint people if they don't get the name on the door, right? That that's that that's an important part there. So, you're 29, 30 entertainers now. 2010, LaForce Entertainment. How how many did you have in those first few years? So I did a dinner. I did a dinner for the people that were willing to come on board and. Uh, myself included, there were 10 of us. So I, I probably talked to 30 or 40 DJs and I had 10 that were like, yes, I want to do this. Um, okay. Cause my, you know, my pitch, it was a long thing, but the, just the gist, the elevator speech of my pitch was uh, I went after DJs that were good, that I knew were good entertainers from their reputation, from working with them, from seeing them. Um, I went after DJs that were good entertainers that didn't necessarily want to mess with the business side or were, and, and this was the hard part. And I, I probably stepped on some toes with people, but the people that I knew weren't very strong at the business side. And I, I kind of would just tell them like, like, I know that the business side is a struggle for you. Um, you know, I have my business background and I want to take this and make this an actual real company um, and make it so that people that are entertainers can actually focus on doing the part that makes them money. And so some people got it and some people didn't because um, in the event industry, for those of you that are considering scaling, you have to remember that some people want to be, uh, some people want to be entrepreneurs. Some people want to be self-employed. They want to be their own boss. And, and we don't have time to get into all that, but you go look up because there's a difference between being self-employed and being an entrepreneur. There are different drives, different mindsets, and you need to understand both to scale because um, you're going to, you're going to encounter people that just want to have their own business. And then you're also going to encounter people that are fully happy to, to not have to deal with, uh, taxes and payroll and all the things that go with an accountant and all the times you have to talk to a lawyer and all the other fun things that come along with actual scaling up and making something that, uh, that can grow into something. Cause you know, the other piece of scaling is, and this is the hard part that people have to be prepared for with the event industry is a lot of times there's not buyers for, you know, a lot of businesses, you, you go start, you have some fantastic idea for a restaurant or a food chain and you go create the box that can be built and ran in some other city, whether it's, or, or another part of your own city. Um, and a lot of people build companies like that, knowing that, there are these restaurant groups that just come along and sweep up these concepts, these ideas and do various things with them. 
That's not necessarily the case in the event industry. You are building something that um, someone else may never buy. And that is a weird, a weird mm -hmm. approach to the business because you have to really be, you, you can't think like some of your friends that may be trying to build something to sell. Um, but at the same time, you have to, because if you're not, you may never find a buyer for it because some other photographer that you're dealing with, if you're a photographer, or in my case, a DJ, um, you know, for me, it's, there are not a lot of other DJ companies and DJ owners in town that would have the resources to come buy a company that has 30 other DJs right, or right, right, would right. want to borrow that kind of money. So, okay, well, well, so let me ask you a question. How many yeah. of your 30 entertainers have, uh, what we would call a, a day job? Um, that's a great question. It is probably, uh, it's probably two thirds of them. It's probably about 20 of them. There are about 10 of them that try to do this full time. Um, because I'm very clear with them that, you know, the, uh, DJing is a great secondary job. It's a challenging primary job. Um, with a lot of things in the industry, especially for those, for people that are specific to the wedding side of things, you know, it mostly only happens a couple of days of the week. Um, and you end up with a bunch of days of, that are unused capacity. And so, uh, it, it, yeah, it's, it's a challenging, it's a challenging primary job, but I have, I have DJs that do do it and do pursue it. Um, but yeah, most of my DJs have other jobs. Right. And there's nothing wrong with that because it doesn't Not at interfere. All. If you, if you have Monday to Friday and you're working Saturday nights doing weddings, cause we know that's the popular day, nothing wrong with it. Uh, it's the same with the speaking world. Uh, you know, if I, if all I did was speak, it would be a really hard road to get to the kind of income I want, which is another discussion, which is everybody's got different needs. You know, somebody might be happy doing it full time, working, whatever they're working. They don't want the other job. They like going, I don't know, hiking or surfing or whatever. And, Go for it, you know, go do it, that's fine. And we should never say you're right or you're wrong because what's right for them is what's right for them. What's right for us is what's right for us. Uh, but I was curious about that, you know, the, the idea of the business. I've, this is how I started speaking. I, in the wedding industry, when I was publishing wedding magazines, I had so many talented, really nice people that were my customers, but they just didn't know how to run a business. <laughs> they, just, they just didn't know how to run a business. And I started speaking about business because I'm like, listen, if they go out of business, I lose a customer. So it was kind of selfish, you know, at, at that point. Uh, you and I have a little similar backgrounds. Uh, my degree is in marketing and accounting. I'm the son of a CPA. Um, I chose not to go into accounting. I didn't get into it and then get out like, you know, you did. Um, but I was in a job that I hated, which got me into the wedding and event industry. People that come into our industry with a business background definitely approach it differently than people that got in even the way that you did, right? I was DJing in college, right? Yeah. If you didn't go into business, how many DJs do you know that got into the business the exact same way, but they didn't have the business background that you did? And and then they're floundering, right? They're, they're treading water going, I don't understand. My, these other DJs are making money. I'm not making any money. Um, I think what's interesting about your multi-op model is a lot of people, when they think of this multi-op, they think of low price, high volume, you know, because that's what they see a lot of them. Like you said, they're not training their people. They're not doing investing in their people, which is what you described. No, Somebody absolutely. Who's listening here is, you know, the, how long have your people been with you? Uh, wow. I've got a lot of members on my team that are, um, I would say the bulk of my DJs have been with us for more than five years. Mm -hmm. Um uh, yeah, the bulk of my team has been with me for, for in that five to 10 year range. I have a very high retention ratio. Um, I, I pay my team well. Uh, I mean, that's, that is, that is the secret sauce to that is that I, I pay my team well. And more than anything, I'm very clear with them about how the compensation works and how, uh, I have real conversations with them about the fact that like, you know, with the way that we do our compensation, the way that we do our split, um, I'm very clear with them, like that the money that is the company's doesn't go into my pocket. I'm always very clear that it's not like, I want them to look at it. It's not like you make $500 and I turn around and stick $500 in my pocket or however you want to look at it. That I'm like, right. that is absolutely not the case. I'm trying to operate on a very tiny margin, uh, at the end of the day for net net profit. Mm -hmm. Um, it's just the, it's just the nature of the beast. And so you have to pay your people. Well, um, I, I would caution anyone that is listening to this, thinking about scaling 
and trying to figure out the masses side of it that you're going to if you're if you're in a major metro area and you're like, oh, well, there are 10,000 weddings in my market uh, every quarter, every year, whatever it is. And if I can price it this aggressively and capture 70 uh, percent of that, first of all, you're not going to. And second of all, you're going to kill yourself. Uh, you're going to kill yourself if you if, if you want to do anything that is like that, where you're operating on a very small margin going after the budget side of things, go create, do something and do something outside of the event industry. Um, I, let me save you a lot of heartache because on the people element and just the what you are going to have to deal with as the owner, as the leader, as the whatever title you give yourself, you're going to have to deal with a lot of people and they're going to be the hardest part of this whole thing. And, um, and if you are, if you put yourself in a position where you are constantly having to hire and train and just develop strictly for replacement, you know, cause that, that is the thing is if you're not going to pay your team, well, it is a replacement game. It is a, you're going to use the, and there's a cat and I respect cash cows, but it is very hard in this industry to do that because of the nature yeah. of the business and the specificity of what people have to know. And then the amount of the, you know, the amount that people can learn over six months because um, with events primarily happening on weekends, you know, how many events can they do in a weekend over six months, you've got 26 weekends. Um, it, it's not a lot of experience compared to for any of you that have worked another job, in a month, you get 20 days of experience working a Monday to Friday job. You get 20 days of experience just in a month. Where, whereas in events, that may take you six months to get to that same level of experience. And that staff doesn't have the same retention because of the gaps in between when they do it. So if you're gonna do it, go, at, go after, uh, don't go after the budget, don't mess with it. It will murder you at least, you know, if, if, go after the luxury, go after the mid market, do something that actually is fruitful to you and to your team. You know, the, the transparency that you talked about, transparency breeds trust. You have honest conversations with your people, you show them where the money is going. Uh, and then there's no animosity to, oh, you know, Glenn's putting all this money in his pocket and all that kind of stuff. No, they see where it is. They see what's going. Plus, Paying your people well leads to the retention. The, the cost of replacing people, you describe two costs there. One is the monetary cost, and the other is just the physical cost on you as a person, always having to think, oh my God, who's gonna leave next? And how do I how do I train them? And how do I get those jobs? Oh, I don't want that stress. Kind of exactly. So it, the flip it, side it, of it is I get to throw my, I get to throw my proverbial weight around in the, in the sense of, and, and uh, for me, I take a lot of pride and while I don't have, like, while I don't get to see other people's numbers and what they're taking home, yeah. I take a lot of pride knowing that I'm pretty confident that three to five of the top 10 highest paid DJs in my market are on my team, possibly more. But I'm, right. I'm, I, if somebody in my market wanted to challenge me that and wanted, or were willing to come in with tax returns and W2s, I'm, <laughs> I'm, I'm willing to take the bet because I'm, I'm very confident that at least three to five of the top 10 entertainers, DJ wise in my market or on my team, because I pay my people well, because, right. and, and that's a source of pride for me because I know right. that no one in here can legitimately, no one in my market can legitimately talk noise about me that, uh, about me or my team, because if they actually talk to my team, my team makes great money. They're happy. They're paying their bills. They're sustaining their family. They're doing all the things. And as I recruit and as I get other people that want to talk to me about joining my, joining my company, or there's people that have wanted to relocate to Texas after everything that we've gone through. Um, and it's a great conversation to be able to talk to like, listen, here's kind of where we are. I've got team members that their W2s end up being, you know, kind of in this range. I've got team members that end up being here. We are a, uh, we are an equal, opportunity employer, not an equal outcome employer, meaning that you got to put in the work for the outcome. Um, so let, let's go, let's just a couple of more scaling things uh, yeah. to, to wrap up here. As you scaled up, you went from you to 10 people now up to 30 people. What is the marketing challenge you have for bringing in enough inquiries to fill the calendar for those 30 people? That's a great question. It is the, the challenge for me now is 
is is the the filling that funnel to a level that that can sustain because um i I have to have a healthy respect for if i don't keep my team if i don't keep my team busy they're not going to make money and then and then the then they're going to turn on me and um i'm very aware of that so it's it is really focusing on how do you build those relationships how do you uh develop how do you have the conversations with planners, catering managers, photographers, clients, all the people that are influential to the decision-making process and just understanding, you know, the little things if there are nuances with, they're unhappy with a member of my team, you know, some, they had uh, not even so much a bad experience, but they just had a DJ that they didn't like, or they didn't get the same vibe from, from the DJ that they normally like to refer and work with uh, and, and being clear, like what we're trying to do on that front but it's it, it it is also spending money on actual advertising and knowing that it you can't it, you have to diversify your buckets you're you're gonna have to advertise on um some sort of site like a we have brides of north texas which is a magazine and a publication here obviously the knot and wedding wire um there are other dj specific ones um so you're gonna have to do some advertising you're but you're really gonna have to put the the bulk of your effort into uh, the actual relationships and you're going to have to have people on your team. And this is the big one and the hard one. You're gonna have to have people on your team that you trust and can have a good relationship with because, you know, for my example, I, there's so many venues and wedding planners in my market that I, I couldn't touch all of the, if I just set out to do, you know, three to five a day, uh, I still wouldn't be able to touch them all in a, in a year. Um, and, and when you think about that, a wedding planner that I talk to and, um, and, and, and try to do some networking with, and they don't hear from me for another year is, is a problematic sign. So you're going to have to have people that you trust, that you feel confident to represent your brand and, uh, and to kind of go after that, that, that width, that breadth of being able to, to cover a large number of people in developing relationships so your your people understand again five to ten years with the company their name personally their personal brand under the laforce umbrella people know them the venue knows that this is so and so this you know this is nate and laforce and they're as joined at the hip as glenn is with laforce right their brand within a brand right so it your people have to understand that they're brand ambassadors when mm-hmm. they're out there as well. But of course they wanna be referred, right? If they do a wedding, they want that planner or that venue to say, I want Nate to come back. I want, you know, Susan to come back. I want that person as well, because that's that means more money for them as well. So the, the the relationships, not putting all your eggs in one basket, these are important lessons for everybody. If you're, if you're trying to do 10 weddings a year, you can probably get them from one source. I, I would hate to have all my eggs in one basket, no matter what, uh, but you could, but when you're trying to do, um, Let's not talk 2020, Glenn. Uh, in a normal year, yeah. <laughs> and let's and let's not talk 2021. Although in Texas, maybe you didn't have as many moved as some as we did in New Jersey. But in a normal year, how many weddings would LaForce do? In a normal year, LaForce will do about. I'm trying to think because in a normal year we would do about 2,000 events, but we also do corporate schools, some other right. stuff. So weddings, okay. is, weddings is going to make up um probably about 1200 events because it's about 60 okay. percent of our business right that, that that's a lot of events which a ton of events a of, which, which means again 2000 events it's a lot of pipeline it's a lot of back end it, it the, the the business end the entrepreneur you said it very well that entrepreneur is different than being self-employed self-employed means somebody paid you to go do something you're self-employed done you right got your 10 and there's nothing days. wrong with being self-employed as long as you are respectful and recognize that when you're self-employed you you not only have to be the money maker but you don't have anything that someone's going to buy so your exit strategy can be nothing around selling anything other than the assets of the company so there's nothing wrong with being self-employed but it's it's bad to treat a business like you're an entrepreneur trying to build something to sell when you're actually self-employed right again another important point here probably that's a great one to end off on if your exit strategy is i want to have an asset to sell that's more than the physical asset so in your case speakers and systems and stuff like that you have to have something that's more valuable the relationships are part of that the structure is part of that all the systems you have in place is part of that the name 
is part of that so that if Glenn decides to go on vacation, the business still runs. If Glenn decides yes. to sell, the business still runs. So that is a great way to end off here on scaling. We could be talking about this for hours, but we're not sitting together with a glass of Texas whiskey. <laughs> so we will do that another time. Soon though. But, but soon, very soon. So Glenn, thank you so much for joining me. Thank you for sharing with everybody about this. It's a great story, a high-end multi-op. It's not something people hear about all the time and you do it and you do it so well. So thank you. Thank you and uh, say hi to you, the lovely Jennifer the, who donated her name to your business. I appreciate that. I look forward to seeing her as well. Thanks for joining me. Thanks for tuning in to this episode of the Wedding Business Solutions Podcast. Full transcripts of this and every episode are available on my website at allenberg.com. And if you have any questions about anything in this episode or any of the episodes, or you'd like to make a suggestion for a future topic or a guest for one of my dialogue episodes, you can email me directly at alan at weddingbusinesssolutions.com. Uh, please subscribe to this channel, post a review if your platform allows it, and if you don't get email updates of the latest episodes, as well as upcoming workshops and masterclasses that I have, you can join at connectwithallenberg.com. I look forward to seeing you on a future episode. Thanks.